thank you for coming out on a, on a Tuesday night um, for tonight's gathering. Thank you to Ska for putting this together. Um, uh, my name is John Page. I'm the head of the upper school. Um, somehow I was way really into moderating this. I think it had to do with some dance I did at homecoming as if I don't mind being up in front of crowds, but I'm, I'm keenly aware that Dr. Baral is videotaping me right now, so I'm, I'm getting my frozen moment. So um, tonight what we're doing is we're having a general symposium and discussion uh, um, kind of night about adolescent health, teen health, uh, talk about a lot of the current issues uh, going uh, around um, and, and, and giving you a chance to ask questions. And so what's gonna happen is one of the members of uh, um, John Hopkins All Children's is gonna give a short presentation to you, but then most of the night is gonna be a Q&A that's gonna involve myself, the upper school counselor, and, and some other members of the um, John Hopkins All Children's team to essentially ask the questions you have, because we thought that would be a better use of the time that all of your children are different and all of your concerns are different and, and what do we see and what do we know happening? I'm gonna introduce Dr. Jasmine Reese. Uh, I got to meet Dr. Reese, I guess it's, I guess it's well, three months ago now that her and her team came to present to the upper school, uh, particularly about vaping and, and Juul cigarettes. And they had this great interactive comedic presentation. They walked through the students of a variety of things. Um, some of the students in the room were like, knew so much they were adding things like, oh, you forgot popcorn on or something like that is what I was hearing them say. And then others uh, uh, were, were kind of sharing other stories. One of the stories that night or that day was um, one of the first people that ever had a e-cigarette device explode in their face lived in St. Petersburg. And, and Dr. Reese and her team shared that and immediately so a student later came up and was like, I know that person who lived on my street. Um, and so it, it started a, a conversation about a variety of things. And from the beginning, uh, it was Scott's plan and our plan to also bring Dr. Reese back to talk to parents. Um, and so that's what this night is, is finally kind of making that happen. And so I'm gonna uh, let Dr. Jasmine Reese come up and speak to you a little bit. She'll introduce her team and then she'll present and then we'll um, go through the Q&A section. So um, Dr. Jasmine Reese. Day. Uh, this is my third time here at Your Press, and I have to say this, this school is amazing, it's lovely. I'm so excited every time Lisa reaches out to ask us to come and talk about some of these really hot topics in the adolescent world. Um, I really love bringing information to the community, and so you know, all done a wonderful job at, at inviting us, so thank you for that. Um, thank you for giving us time today, and I know I'm sort of being highlighted as um, the person who, who put this together, but really I cannot do any of this with uh, the rest of my team. Um, adolescent medicine is not an organ like most other things, like, you know, we have the brain and the heart and those specialists and the bones and, um, you know, surgeons and things like that, but adolescent medicine is more of a population-based specialty, and so it's really not just one thing I can focus on. It's really kind of like the mind, body, soul, behavior. There's lots of things that go into it. Um, and that's why I cannot do um, any of this care well without the support of other specialists. Um, so thank you again for having us. And so what I do, again, is adolescent medicine. Uh, we have a specialty clinic at Jones Hopkins Health Children's Hospital. I mainly focus on outpatient care, um, about four half days per week, and the rest of my time is really in more of the educational side where I have residents and medical students um, that I train with the support of other members and, and faculty members. Um, and so um, that's kind of what I do on a day-to-day, -day, but I wanted to give an opportunity to the rest of the team members so that you know what they do, who they are, and what they do at the hospital. Good evening. My name is Valerie Valley. I'm a sports psychologist, but that means I'm a clinical psychologist by training who specializes in working with the population of athletes and high performers. Um, what that means also is that I work along the continuum of mental health from diagnosing and treating mental illness to using psychological skills to enhance performance. My primary responsibilities are providing clinical services to the IMG community, and so I hold a clinic there four days a week, and one day a week I am at the hospital um, providing direct clinical care services to our athletes and high performers. Thank you. Hi all, my name is Kat Libran and I am a child life specialist. 
So what that means is that I help support the psychosocial needs of children in the medical setting, but also helping them transition outside of the medical setting with um, new diagnoses or new um, conditions into their home life. So helping them build positive coping skills and <coughs> promote positive coping in their home life to better um, support them through school with the new diagnoses or um, chronic hospital visits, things along those lines. I also am the facilitator of our Teen Advisory Council. So this is a group of teens from the ages of 12 to 18, and they are either patients or teen siblings of patients who feel confident enough in their experiences in the hospital to speak on behalf of the patient body. And it's their roles to advocate for what they think is important in the hospital. And um, I've actually been able to do a lot of that alongside Dr. Reese in her clinic. So um, I hope I'm able to support you guys now with any questions that you may have. And feel free to reach out after if there's anything that you need me to clarify. I'm Brenna. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist. And um, I have multiple roles at the hospital. So I primarily do inpatient on our medical surgical floor. So I see a variety of uh, different patients on the inpatient side. And then I also do some outpatient work as well, um, focusing mostly with uh, weight management and then um, gastrointestinal issues for diseases. And then one day a week, I also work with Dr. Reese. We have a specialized clinic for a specialized clinic for adolescents diagnosed with eating disorders. Um, so I also support her in that clinic as well. So if you guys have any questions regarding nutrition, um, I'm happy to answer those. And I've got some materials too if you're interested afterwards as well. I can talk about adolescent medicine stuff for hours. So I think it was really challenging to give you like the really brief highlights um, but I hope that at least what you can take away is just how we can sort of create a healthy and safe environment for our teens, advocate for their safety and wellness, and just let you know about some of the resources you've already heard about today but there's so many at the hospital and I have other lovely colleagues that are right here in Flint that can also help with that. All right, so just sort of defining adolescent health or adolescents in general. Um, we're talking about kids or teens that are really 10 to 11 to all the way up to 24, 25 years old. So depending on kind of what Google search you do or what major organization you're looking at the definition for, if you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics, they define it as 11 to 21 year olds. The CDC and the World Health Organization will say adolescents are 10 to 19 or young adults 20 to 24. So somebody who's an adolescent health specialist, um, basically is somebody who probably went through a pediatric residency training or maybe even family medicine or internal medicine, and then did a further specialty training just to focus on that age group of, for adolescents. Um, and so other areas, if you're not working in a children's hospital, might be an adult hospital, might be in a community health center, might be in a college health center. Um, so typically what people think of when they think of like teen health, they're thinking of, okay, you must be a doctor who talks about sex drugs and rock and roll. Um, and so that's probably was true back in the day, but now there's so many advances in technology and what behaviors teens are engaging in, so it's really become so much more. And like I said, even with what I do, even though it's not just one organ, it's kind of population-based, it really does involve community efforts, other specialists, multidisciplinary care to really help get our, our teens on track with what they need. So why does this become so important and why we need all of these other disciplines? If you look at sort of the top leading causes of death in, in the adolescent and young adult age group, we're talking about unintentional injuries like motor vehicle accidents, suicide and homicide. So those are really three big issues. Um, you can talk for hours on end on just one of those, but now we're thinking about what are, what are the causes of these three leading causes of death. We're talking about mental health issues, we're talking about high risk behaviors, substance use, substance abuse, um, bullying in the schools, social media, there's so much that goes into just those three. So again, this is really gonna be sort of a snapshot of behaviors that I'm gonna go through, just to open up um, some dialogue later on for more questions, but understand there's so much more that can go into each and every one of these things that we talk about. And so you 
probably already familiar with adolescents in general, right? Sometimes the teen looks very mature, very well developed, but their mind is probably not caught up to their physical appearance. And so there's a lot of influences out there right now during those adolescent years that really affect how the rest of the time frame goes. So what behaviors they're engaging in for their influences, it's peers, it's family members, it's their surrounding, their environment, what activities they're engaging in, all of that becomes very important in how they're making decisions long term. So why do teens need a special approach? Well, basically because there's a lot of stuff going on. They're in the middle of a sort of mental shift if you will, and, and Dr. Um, Sally will talk more about that later, I'm sure. And so we know brain development takes a really long time. So well into their mid-20s, the brain is still in development. So even though they probably overcome puberty already, they made it that far, their brain is still trying to catch up with everything else going on. So they're trying to think about how they feel themselves, how they identify becoming independent. They're having all of these body changes image awareness, all of those things become more and more important. So just to sort of break it down, there's early, middle, and late adolescence. So for early adolescents, we're usually talking about the 11 to 14 year old age group. So some physical changes are happening. They're just starting puberty. They're more of a concrete thinker. So they're not gonna like read the fine print and what you're saying. If you want them to do something, you should really say it's very straightforward if you want it to actually get done. Um, their self-concept, they're more preoccupied with their body changes, a little more self-conscious about things happening. Um, they start to want more privacy at this age. They're more involved in the same-sex peer groups. They're kind of like the boys are yucky if they're a girl or, you know, something of that nature. Um, they have more kind of curiosity um, in sexuality, but they're not quite ready to talk about it as much yet. And this is, again, um, on average, right? The typical sort of 11 to 14 year old. For middle adolescents, this is usually around 15 to 17. Again, physical changes are happening now. We're talking about sort of that um, peak height growth that they um, might have. Their cognitive characteristics, they're more abstract in thinking. So maybe they're reading a little between the lines a little bit more now. They still have a strong self-concept and concern about how they look and body image. Um, they really like independence, right? They feel like mom and dad don't know anything. I've got this. I can make my own decision. Um, and that's where some of the conflict comes in, right? So mom's never right. They never know anything. I love in the office when I say something and then the mom is like, look what she just said. I told you that. And I'm like, cut, cut. <laughs> um, but it happens quite often. For peers, now they're having more of a mixed group, right? So there's guys, girls in the group. It's not, um, the opposite sex is not yucky anymore. Um, there's more initiation of relationships and sexual curiosity. For late adolescents, we're now the 18 to 21 year olds. Um, usually by this age, they have completed puberty. Um, so body changes are, are pretty much where they're going to be. Um, Cognitive characteristics, they're more future oriented. They should be thinking about what they want to be when they grow up. Are they going to go to college? Are they going to go out to the workforce? Um, more stable body image, more um, autonomous, more independent. They should be able to start making decisions now. Um, and again, more of this one on one relationship now. So maybe they're in a serious relationship. Um, and again, you know, they, if they might be more sexually curious or sexually active. So what we do in clinic, when we're talking about like a psychosocial assessment, typically when a teen comes in um, for either their initial visit or their follow-up visit, I really try to spend some time together as the teen and the parent who might be with them during that visit, just kind of tease out what are the concerns today, and then we always take a few minutes apart. So I usually have some one-on-one -on -one time with the parent and some one-on-one -on -one time with the teen. Um, when I'm with the teen, I'm, I'm kind of giving you the, the background sneak peek information. You're not supposed to know this stuff, but this is what I'm asking. So my mnemonic is a, it's called the HEADS um, assessment. This is what most doctors are trained to use. And it's just a way for us to remember what questions to ask teens. 
Safe teams is basically the same questions in a different order. I like the heads because it really starts out with usually like the nine things, like how's home life, how's school going, and then it gets into those nitty gritty questions like are we experimenting with any substances, smoking, um, are we in any romantic relationships, how's our mental health doing, any thoughts of hurting yourself, hurting somebody else. And so we usually use that approach during every visit. Sometimes you spend a long time on one of those letters and less on others, and it really just depends on the dialogue that's happening during the visit. So I wanted to highlight some of these high risk behaviors. Why am I spending so much time with the team going through all of those things? Um, because nationally and worldwide, we know that teens are engaging in different behaviors that puts them at very high risk of different things. So again, all leading up to those like three leading causes of death for their age group. We want to keep them safe. We want them to be educated, but we're not going to know any of those answers if we don't ask the questions. And so, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey. This is something easily, uh, you can Google easily. Um, if you look up CDC YRBS, this is a survey that's national that goes out every two years to schools across the country and they gather information um, on high school students. And so they're asked lots and lots of questions. The document PDF on, on the CDC website is about 479 pages, so it's a quick, easy read. Um, but what I've done for you is just sort of take some highlights from there so I can share some of those results. So, um, because we have our dietitian, I wanted to make sure we were highlighting some of those high risk behaviors of, you know, the recommendation. We want them to eat healthy, right? We want them to get good sleep. We want them to be physically active. So these are just some numbers. I'm not going to go one by one, but just for your reference. Um, they're asked different questions on this survey, so you know, not everybody is great at being physically active and eating the way we want them to eat. So some of the ones that I, I wanted to highlight, most of the teens, just anecdotally from my experience, they don't like to eat breakfast. Um, nobody likes to eat breakfast. Maybe it's because they don't have time in the morning, they're rushing to just get out the door, they don't have an appetite yet, their body's just not awake. We really want them to eat breakfast. Um, it's really good source of energy so they can go to school and be alert oriented and learn. Um, but just because they skip breakfast probably doesn't mean they have an eating disorder. Um, well, that is definitely something during the visit that we're going to ask about. How's their diet? What are they eating? Are they skipping any meals? And those are routine questions that we like to know. And I bring that up because one of the uh, stats that they highlighted for this section of that survey was 47.1% were trying to lose weight. Um, and again, this is just survey results, but that just reminded me, um, we always ask, if they are trying to lose weight, are they trying to lose weight in a healthy way, how are they doing it? Um, and Brenna mentioned that we work together at eating disorder clinic once a week. Um, and I can say that since we sort of opened that clinic, it's been two years that we're doing this once a week clinic. We went from zero patients, and we've grown to have by 224% in two years. That's like astounding to me um, because they're coming from all over. So not just Pinellas County, but counties outside of here. There's not a lot of people doing eating disorder work. Um, I know Dr. Valley also um, says that she's in a sports academy where weight is very important. So I know she can speak to that as well. Um, and so it, it's just something not to forget and we just want to make sure that when we're talking about eating habits, the focus is usually on obesity and overweight, um, but there's also the underweight category that often gets missed or diagnosed very late. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. <clears throat> Other high-risk behaviors, so sexual behaviors. So 39.5% um, had said on that survey that had sexual intercourse before, 3.4% before age 13. Um, in 2015, when the first survey started asking about um, like gender identity questions, and so um, that's some now data that's becoming more routine. So 85.4% um, had identified as heterosexual, and so then the remainder had identified as something else, either uncertain or bisexual or gay or lesbian. Substance use, and again, this is in, in, encompassing a lot of different types of substances. So almost 30% have tried a cigarette. I can say, I don't remember even one maybe my time here at All Children's that anybody was saying they were smoking cigarettes. It's 
vaping, it's marijuana. Those two have sort of skyrocketed. Cigarettes are less popular, I would say, in this age group. Um, many have said that they're using electronic vape products. Um, drinking alcohol is it's always a very casual sort of party experience, but many still are drinking alcohol. Um, using marijuana, about 35.6%. Again, this is national data over um, across the country. And then still um, a good amount that are taking prescription drugs that are not prescribed to them. <coughs> Mental health disturbance, the data on this survey. So, so many teens um, struggling with depression, feeling sad, feeling hopeless, having suicide plans. Um, mental health is probably one of the biggest things I get a referral for. I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, um, but many pediatricians in, in the general pediatric world weren't necessarily trained to really tease through those details as much because this seems to have be an area that just keeps growing. The anxiety and depression, why is that so? I think we can come up with lots of theories on there. Um, social media, technology, the peer pressure, bullying, all of these things have been increasing. And I think that is helping lead to this um, mental health issue. Um, and so, so in my training, um, I have taken sort of extra steps to understand better how to screen for teen depression and how to diagnose it and how to initiate management. But if truly your teen is, has severe depression, we certainly want to get a psychiatrist and a psychologist involved for their care. Um, other data include safety concerns, um, electronically getting bullied also is on the rise. Um, it's, it's a huge trigger for kids that identify as heterosexual, but also very, very um, high risk for kids who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. Um, again, we're seeing so much with the social media. Everybody has access to their phones 24 seven. So if they're getting bullied at the school, they really have no release from that. Um, as soon as you go home, you also can get on the computer or on your phone and get the same sort of bullying dialogue going. And that's gonna really weigh into their mental health long term. I just wanted to put a, a little more emphasis on some of those high-risk behaviors. So some of the things we're seeing more and more of, um, not only your iPhones are getting bigger, but the marijuana use. I'm seeing so much of that. Um, and it's, it's kind of viewed as not a big deal. Um, so back in the day, I think it, it's easy for some parents to think, well, my kid is just experimenting. I did that. I'm not addicted to marijuana. It's no big deal. They're just trying it. Um, but what has changed over time is really the potency of that marijuana, where it's coming from, how it's grown, all of those things affect the potency. And that's different from back in the 70s or 80s when um, maybe older adults now were experiment experimenting back then. Um, and that's really, I think, the concept that teens are not understanding now. It's very addictive, it's very dangerous, and typically they don't know the source of where it came from. So they could be um, ingesting or inhaling or smoking something that's very, very potent that can be very detrimental to them. And it really does affect brain development. So it's a conversation we're constantly having, um, but it is definitely a challenge. It's a battle. Um, you know, with legalization and all of these other things that are counteracting the things that we're saying, it is really tough to get people to stop and to get teens to understand the gravity of that. Oh, and I wanted to point out the 28 that's on the slide there. Um, so this national um, data that I'm talking about with the wire, yes, the Pinellas County Public Schools are a part of that um, data. And so the 28% is um, the teens that were, the high school teens that were smoking marijuana, or had said that they smoked marijuana um, in the 2015 survey. Um, for vaping, this is just another sort of snapshot of who's saying that they're vaping. So you tend to see more prevalent in the older grades. Now, if you're looking at this slide, it looks like it's not a big deal because they're showing a 12.5%. Anytime you look up information on some of these sites, um, sometimes that's the research that happened like two years before that. And so this is a little bit old, a year or two old. 
it's really like four years old because we know that this is much more prevalent. We're seeing it a lot more. And again, the 18% is from our Pinellas County School survey results. Um, there's one study that I wanted to just highlight this, this um, chart here because they were asking in their study why were teens trying e-cigarettes? What do they like about it? And it's really interesting because when I came to this school to talk to your middle school students and your high school students, um, it became very apparent by some of their questions and comments why they were interested in it or why they would even want to do it. Um, somebody asked a great question like, can I just vape water? But you just want to look cool, you want to fit in, it, the peer pressure is there. Um, and so, so according to this study results, some of the reasons that they teased out were curiosity, looking cool, the flavoring, right? There's like bubble gum, gummy bears, strawberry, and all of those sound really fun and fruity and like they're really targeting your teens and younger kids. Um, and so none of them really thought about it as being dangerous or harmful to their health or thinking about long-term effects, which is typical for an adolescent. Uh, but many of them really, it was just about being curious and wanting to fit in. I wanted to show you some pictures. This is exactly what I actually showed um, your teens and students. What do these vape devices look like? Um, they have to be aware of what it is and we need to be aware of what it is because they already know this stuff. We're the ones that are still learning. Um, and so this is just some pictures of different devices that they can be using. So there's e-cigarettes and vape pens and mods. Um, some of them look like flash drives. They're very easy to hide. They even sell like clothes and sweaters that help you sneak around with this stuff. And this is all very easily accessible. You can buy it online. Um, you can buy it from your neighbor. You can buy it off the street. I mean, it's, it just exists everywhere. I had, um, I played a nice fun game with them when I came to do the talk. And we would do one, one sort of picture at a time so they can tell me if they knew where lead was found or where do they find formaldehyde. And these are all the toxic chemicals, not all, these are just some of the toxic chemicals that are in vape products. Um, and, and they did know what all of those things were. They knew where they were found. Um, what they probably didn't know is that it was in their vape product or in the vape product that their friend was using. Um, so there was a lot of um, sign, I think, when I was going through some of these slides. Um, I know um, you mentioned some of the, the images, and we even had people in our local community, um, unfortunately, die or suffer from some really harmful events because of exploding uh, vape products. And so these are just some images from severe burns that occurred. Uh, there's lots of news stories that are easy to use to. But I think this was also very graphic for them, and especially for the younger kids, they didn't like this. They didn't like this. <laughs> they may have been sleeping during the other part, but this, this person. <laughs> um, mental health, just another area, again, just to highlight, because again, we're seeing so much of it, and it's a huge national issue, um, and I would even say in the world. Um, there are many cultures that don't recognize depression. Um, and so there's just a lot of education I think that we need to do for each other and for our families and for the teens. Um, this statistic that I actually just looked at today, 3.1 million adolescents in the 12 to 17 year old age group had at least one major depressive episode in the last year. That's a lot of teen depression. In most of the cases, we see little to no treatment or they go undiagnosed. Um, and that's where we get that suicidal and homicidal and those, those national statistics of um, high-risk behaviors. Um, so, so many of our teens are struggling with mental health, and so it's important for us to really understand what are the warning signs. So if your teen was an average student or getting good grades and had drastic changes in their academic performance or their concentration, or they're becoming more reclusive and hiding in the room and they used to engage more. Um, you know, there are some things that are typical teen behaviors, but if you're really starting to notice some patterns here, things are different in the school life and in the home life, 
and you should be alert for some mood changes, one of which is depression. Um, suicidal ideation is, it just seems like it's becoming more and more common. There's a lot of social media negative dialogue happening. Um, you know, if we don't like you, you should just go kill yourself. I mean, those are just like blatant comments that I've seen teens show me. Um, it's, it's, I don't remember that happening when I was younger, um, even to my friends. And so it's just different now. And I think just being aware that those conversations are happening, the apps that your teens are using, um, just make sure you're checking in with them and ask them about those mood changes and what might be triggering them. And so I don't want to end on a depressing note, but um, those are sort of the highlights of, of high-risk behaviors or adolescent um, topics that are really kind of hot topics right now. Um, but just to share with you quickly what an adolescent visit really can look like and what we sort of aim for. Um, the University of, of Michigan, if you Google the University of Michigan Adolescent Health Initiative, they have wonderful adolescent health, um, adolescent driven videos where the teens themselves are actually creating this for parents to use, for teens to use, for doctors to use. Um, so this is a really good example of that and she's just really talking to the teen of how they can advocate for themselves. So I wanted to play this for you. Hi, I'm Lee, and I'm the K-5 Youth Council at the University of Michigan Adolescent Health Initiative. And I'm gonna show you ways to get the most out of your healthcare experiences as a teen. As much as doctors, nurses, and clinic staff want to help, it's also up to you to make sure you get the care you need. Let's wrap it on her mom visiting a doctor. So how are you two doing today? We're great. Right. And uh, you're in for just a checkup today? Mm -hmm. Yep, Taylor just turned 16, so it's time for her. Oh, does that mean you're a uh, junior kid? Yep. All right. All right. And uh, Taylor, how, how are things going for you at school? Uh, you play any sports or anything? She's really good at hockey. And she um, just thinks about me. Oh, do you like to sing? Love it. Okay. Um, and socially, how are things going for you? Do you have a lot of friends, big friend group? She makes them feel easily. <laughs> and Taylor, uh, how about your classes? You're great. How's that going? I'm doing okay, but I've got a big math test next week. And is it okay if we talk alone? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, we do like to touch base with our team patients for a few minutes by themselves, if you don't mind. Okay. So you're going to ask some questions? Okay. Uh, fire away. I'll start with the top 10. Can I tell you things that you won't tell my mom? What's covering her insurance? What about birth people? How would I get an STD test if I needed one? Am I getting into shots today? How can I get in contact with you privately if you have questions? Did you always know you wanted to be a doctor? Okay, let's break this down. You can see that Taylor's mom is still in the spotlight. It's not an appointment, but some parents have a hard time letting go as their kids get older. Taylor was clearly getting frustrated, but she kept her cool and she arranged her time to speak one-on-one -on -one with her doctor. She brought up some questions to help guide her through her appointment. She made sure to find out the doctor's confidentiality policy so that she could feel more comfortable being open and honest about her health concerns. Also, many health systems now have electronic patient portals to make it easier for you to manage your Alright, so you get the point. Um, so, so that's why we like to spend some time together and some time apart. Um, if you think your teens don't like to talk, they do. Sometimes I have to pull the residents out of the room because I'm like, you've been in there for 35 minutes, what's going on? Um, and so they do like to talk, they do like to ask questions if you give them some space to do that. Um, the goal really of the visit is not to keep secrets. We want to keep you in the loop. We want you part of the conversation, but we want to make sure that they have the open space to share um, the things that they have concerns about. And so I will stop talking now, and hopefully that was just helpful information for you to understand a little bit about adolescents, um, sort of the changes that they're going through. And um, without further ado, I'd like to open up to you to ask questions and make any comments. We're happy to be here. Thank you. So the way we're going to do is I'm going to walk around with a microphone so we can hear each other's questions. Um, and the panel will stay up here. This is also a chance for me to introduce some of our members of our upper school staff. Uh, this is Courtney Ellis coming up. 
she's our upper school uh, counselor. She, uh, we stole her from private practice this last year. Um, and she's come back to Shorecrest where she graduated um, probably two, three years ago, right? Something like that. And, uh, um, and so she, um, uh, I brag on her all the time, but she's been an immediate, amazing resource on campus. And it's not any couple periods I go by to see three or four kids just hanging out in her office all the time. It's become a really great place. And so she volunteered to come tonight to talk about things that she's seen at the school. Uh, Chris Grant, the head of the medical school, wanted to be here. She is freezing in, in D.C. right now with 88th graders. And, and uh, um, so she sends uh, her apologies for not being able to make it. So, um, so to that end, does anyone have any uh, questions? Uh, I'll walk around and see if we want to ask anything of the, the panel. Hi, um, I have a question about uh, why I did a study. Uh, well, the 35% of high school kids, students, assuming my one, that's a scary one. Is this based on high school students or just as students that were seen at the clinic, at an adolescent clinic? For the YMBS results, those are all based on national surveys. So the, the survey went out to a high school and they completed those there. Okay. Yes, yeah, so all students, 9th and 12th. 9th and 12th grade, yeah. Is there any differentiation in between male and female, rates of depression, drug use, sexual activity, etc.? No. <laughs> I want to add because I, I had a bar graph in there that had like race, ethnicity, male, female, all these things, and I just deleted it because how do you interpret that data? And because the boys are lower doesn't mean that they don't have it. We haven't identified it, and so now their bar looks lower than the girls. So I'm glad that you said that. Can you guys hear them? Um, we do tend to say for females, just statistically, they kind of have this like tend and befriend behavior where they are more likely to potentially seek social support. So we might know more when they're struggling. And so not that males struggle any less, but they might struggle in isolation, withdrawal, show kind of different coping strategies than a female. So that kind of looks different, but it doesn't actually mean that it's different. At what age do you encourage them to have some individual time with at the well child check if they're a physician? The recommendation is typically 12 and up. Um, I usually do 12 to 14. Some 12 year olds are really, really mature and some 12 year olds are still younger. And our time alone becomes less fruitful. It's just like, how's it going? And they want mom to be around. So we sense the temperature in the room. If there's something really concerning, usually a parent brings it up and they want me to spend some time alone, it's usually 12 to 14 or so that we start to do the one-on-ones. Uh, I have one that goes to different high schools. She's up very, very early. What's my minimum goal to get her to eat something? Should I be happy that she's going to the Dunkin' Donuts drive-thru? Is she going to and call it a day? Or am I uh, trying, needing to give her some better resources? That's a great question. Um, so usually the thing that I recommend is some sort of carbohydrate paired with some sort of protein. Um, just to ensure that we'll have enough energy to get them until lunch and to keep them full until lunch. Um, so the carbohydrate could be like a whole grain um, product, so that could be like a whole grain piece of toast, a bagel, English muffin, um, or it could be like a piece of fruit instead. And then the protein, um, usually in the morning, if it's you know, sort of a fast-paced morning, you're getting out the door, something easy. So like a hard-boiled egg, you could do a cheese stick, even a glass of milk um, will give you seven or eight grams of protein. So some sort of carbohydrate mixed with some sort of protein is usually the minimum that I recommend. Our boys are five and seven. Uh, I'm assuming, given the trends, this, these topics are only going to get more prevalent. What is the best way to, and how for us to get ahead of this? I would say that is to have conversations with your kids now. Yeah, because they might already know. 
Yeah, I would encourage you to develop a culture and open dialogue in your household, not like not even just about the heavy stuff, like drug use, you know, substance use, um, sex, all of that. But even just, you know, little things like have a non-threatening open dialogue about sport, about hobbies, about games they're interested in. Um, while sometimes, especially as they get older, you're going to hear about like an app they're using and you're like, oh my gosh, I saw something, you know, come up on my news feed about that app, but I know it's bad. Kind of take a step back and be more open ear to it. And then what you'll find is, or what at least what I've observed is that as they get older, they're more willing to talk to you about these things when they do come in contact with it. So because you've already established this culture of, of having open dialogues, now suddenly when they do go to school and they've seen the kid vaping or you know they they heard about their friends smoking marijuana over the weekend they're not just kind of going to hold on to that and then maybe seek other peers to discuss that about and then when peers start discussing that sometimes it becomes a collaboration they'll go to you and be like hey mom oh my gosh daniel said this over the weekend and then he'll already trust your judgment trust your response he or she you know the child um and how you're approaching that, and then they're going to feed off that too. So if you can have like a calm demeanor in that dialogue, they're going to remain calm and still be more open to listening to you. Um, I found that if you, especially in like the hospital setting for patients who come in for um, maybe like Baker X, so that's a child who has been hospitalized due to um, being a risk to themselves or others, or um, maybe they've overused a substance and now they're just receiving medical treatment to be able to become medically stable again. Um, now to get ahead of that is just kind of having that calm, open dialogue. They trust you, you trust them, they're going to come to you about it and then you can almost like avoid that later. You can avoid them going to other peers who are just as immature as they are to learn about these things. Hi, I, um, I'm a sexual health educator locally in Pinellas County, and uh, my question for you is when you work with teens, how do you navigate a teenager that wants to get on a contraception or get STD testing, but maybe can't ask their parents about it, don't want to get getting billed to insurance, or confidentiality really matters? Um, how do you navigate the needs of the teen and then maybe working with the parent to, to communicate and, and, get, and keep the teen safe at the end of the day? Um, thank you. I guess I have to answer that. <laughs> okay, so so as I mentioned, and as the video mentioned right there, so there's some confidenti confidentiality rules and rights that teens have. Um, every state is different, but reproductive health uh, concerns and needs, mental health needs, um, are at least two of the things that they are allowed to ask for without parent permission. Um, if there's a teen who is uh, very high risk in terms of they're very they're sexually active, they're not using protection, who are really trying to prevent pregnancy here, or who, who wants and is asking for birth control and the parent is, for whatever reason, very against it, um, I try really hard to get that teen to open up that discussion with their parent. Because I let them know, yes, they have this right to ask me and I'm here to help them and support that, but um, A, they're on their parents' insurance. It's gonna be really hard to truly keep that a secret. Um, but also, it's important that they have an adult support system outside of being at home. So if something does happen, if they do have an infection or they get pregnant, they need to have somebody else besides doctors advocating for them and helping them. Um, and so maybe today is not the day they're gonna open up to the parent, but we definitely have a discussion. How are we gonna navigate this talk? Because we need to get parent involved somewhere here. Um, again, I let them know that they may get a bill for the screening test that we, that we do or the prescription that we send. So the other options might be going to the health department uh, where they can easily get that. Our, our high school clinics here, some of the public schools have high school clinics. They're not allowed to prescribe um, birth control. And I think that a similar um, sort of mechanism they use if they need to get a prescription, they would have to go to the health department. Um, so it, it's really, again, not to be sneaky. I have to let them know where they can get things. Um, 
but we really do try to make sure that we're keeping that dialogue open and I am certainly there to help them have that conversation when they're ready to have it. Um, I'm a health care provider that uh, oversees the outreach program that does HIV testing and um, STI testing in the community. So I'm um, looking at one of the, the CDC report and it indicated uh, close to 10% um, of teens, I guess, being forced into sexual acts. Is that minor or minor or is that molestation by chance that they're speaking of? That's a great question and I can tell you, again, these are like the highlight results of that like 480 page report. Um, when I was reading through those results, it, it did not clarify. So I don't know exactly what their, their survey questionnaire looks like if it said answer here, if this was, you know, abuse or molestation versus other. I don't know the answer to that. So the way they have it is listed just how I wrote it and it didn't give me further details. That survey, is that information available in Pinellas County or is it all nationwide? So the Pinellas County data that I was putting for some of those slides, um, I got from some of the administrators of the Pinellas County schools. So I don't know if that survey data is public access or not because it, it's collected right to become that YRBS survey data. So I don't think so, um, but our, our uh, clinic works very closely with some of the um, public schools here. And so she shared with me some of the high risk behavior survey data. So that's how I have it, but that all gets blended into this national survey data. So I don't think that you can Google that to my knowledge. I don't think so. I know as, as I've worked in schools, been part of these organizations, we get a snapshot back about ourselves. I've only worked in independent schools, so Pinellas County got a snapshot back so the school board would control that information. And I'm sure they give it to their clinics and then they partner with local groups, but I don't know if you can delineate it out by county through the, through the internet system, so. I do think, too, it's fair to assume, I'm sure everyone would agree, those numbers are probably significantly lower than what's accurate, and if students here will even say, Yes, an anonymous survey. I don't trust that it's anonymous, especially if it's you know conducted on campus. So I think just we know this. We ask the student, how often do you drink? We always kind of know that it's probably lower. So even just assuming that these numbers are staggering as they are, it's probably higher than that. Just to have a frame of reference. We have similar surveys uh, here in school, in the middle school and high school. Do we have some uh, feel about how work kids? in the school and what kind of trend or situation you see you experience just just to share in general terms sure so we do a student health survey roughly every two to three years it, it does a variety of things around bullying and community-based each division does their own thing and one of the programs that miss ellis myself and mr flood are working on is what the next one is going to look like and i think we're the, one of the problems with those surveys is we want them to be very similar so we get longitudinal data but then new things emerge, right? So the last one in 2015, the word vape and e-cigarette was not on there, right? And, that, and then, I mean, this is just a sweep that we've seen the last two, three years. And I have relationships with all the other uh, heads of upper schools in the area, colleagues in California. And so you almost have to rework it as new things emerge. Um, and so we're working on what that's gonna look like. And we use that to understand like a dashboard of, of where we're at. Um, but we do not have certain things in terms of vaping and things like that. We have information that we use around student anxiety, student you know, bullying conditions, relationships, um, sexually risky behavior, drinking, marijuana, some of those things that we, that we can go. But because they change so much, they do far less scientific than I think those with a science background would be comfortable with. It really is a dashboard for us to see where we're at. But Ms. Ellis, myself, and Mr. Flood are working on what the next iteration of that will be. From a psychology standpoint, um, you know, we hear that kids develop a lower self-esteem earlier in life. Uh, that I read somewhere eight-year-old eight girls have some of the lowest self-esteem levels. Uh, are asked when they start to have lower self-esteem from peer relationships. Are there like proven or statistically relevant pieces of advice you could give to help? deal with situations where kids are starting to experience bullying or 
have situations they're uncomfortable with and how we might deal with them before they become adolescents and go through the other changes that make it difficult to deal with them. Square one as a parent is that modeling, so the more as a parent you are modeling a strong sense of self-confidence, self-esteem, um, whatever you want that to look like, it, especially for a daughter, potentially towards her mother, seeing her mother not look in a mirror and put herself down, you know, there's that baseline of seeing it modeled well. Um, I think as much as you don't want to put the name like cognitive behavioral therapy on it, just really teaching them about healthy self-talk and the effects of that on our emotions and our behaviors is really crucial and I think that's something a lot of these teens aren't learning until it's almost so late that these messages are almost like ingrained into their mind of how terrible they are. I think social media is crucial in this because they are in this comparison world every day. They are being flooded with likes and lack of likes and I know if they don't get enough likes they will take the picture down because immediately that just drops your self-esteem and they feel like they're not being seen. So I mean I, I would love as parents if everyone could come alongside each other and just throw all the thumbs into the river or something. At least until they're 24. Yeah, until their brains can all um, so those are a few things to start. Here's one to add. No, I mean, I, I would agree with all that. Um, as a parent, um, I, I think being really um, mindful about um, our reinforcement, how we're shaping behaviors, um, especially you know, working at, from a performance standpoint and with high achieving athletes and students. Um, what is it that you're reinforcing, whether that's consciously or unconsciously? I know that I see too often self-esteem or um, really, again, that self-efficacy, which is belief that I can do something, that, that I have the skills to accomplish whatever the task is. Um, uh, so how do we shape that? And so we do that by really reinforcing those behaviors that are in your child's control. Right? So not uh, uh, reinforcing the outcome so much. So, um, Jimmy, did you win? If that's like the first question, you know, out of your mouth after a competition, or did you get that A? Um, that's the wrong question. Um, we want to really kind of shape those behaviors on the how, because that's what's building resiliency on how we can tolerate um, uncomfortable emotions um, and persist when things are hard. And so, um, on how, how did you do that? Um, we're, we're going to reinforce effort um, our attitude, um, again, these things that are in the child's control, not outcomes. And I would add to that from, from my side, for those of you that monitor your child's social media consumption, they'll, they'll be very angry of saying this, but it is very, it, it's very common that they create two accounts, one for you to see and one for them. They actually have a word for it called Finstagram, like my fake Instagram for my parents, and my fake Snapchat. And so when I enter, you know, interview them or talk to them about things like that, a lot of times a parent will say to me, it's like, why well, have all their social media? And sometimes I have to say, you might, but you might not. Um, and, and being mindful of that, I think, is a really uh, key thing, because sometimes you'll go through their Instagrams and be like, well, this is all those kind of innocuous. Um, it, be mindful of that in, in their own phones, that there's usually multiple accounts. Um, then it's a very common thing that they double up on that. And if, if, if you don't mind, if they ask you who told you that, say Chris Grant. <laughs> you know, like, like Chris Grant said that. Well, so. all of our kids, if they're not actually engaging in these different high risk behaviors, probably have friends who are. So I want to ask about how should they be as friends? Um, what is, yeah, just. A, a, what, a, how should we advise them if they're worried about a friend or if they see something that concerns them? One thing I typically do, and this is depending on the situation, but I encourage them to kind of do that you, me, we approach. Um, and again, this depends because there are certain things that they may not want to come with, but you know, like, why don't either maybe you approach that person and tell them you're concerned. Maybe I approach that person with telling their concern or we. And so I think kind of giving them options where they feel empower empowered to help that person, but knowing that they're not alone, but that there's some sort of accountability. And again, that's if they want to bring it to kind of an upper level, a lot of things they're not going to want to share that with administration and things like that. But if they know there's confidentiality, sometimes they're comfortable kind of taking on that approach and feeling like, okay, I, I can 
can kind of do some of these things and know that there's um, going to be follow through and maybe bringing it to an adult is something that they don't want to do, but they know it's almost necessary. So that's one option depending on the situation. Um, this is a really good question. It's a very layered question. I think that's why we're all like. <laughs> um, I think validating your child is very important. They do come forward to you, providing active listening, um, validating their feelings about maybe what how they feel about what their friend's going through, but also their perception of what their friend's going through. And um, I was gonna actually bring up something similar to what she did and. But I, I would say, if your child doesn't feel comfortable going to a higher person about it, like um, an educator, then coach them in that dialogue. But it's also, I think, very important in your role as a caregiver, while you want to keep the trust of your child, to also recognize what is your child telling you and what level of risk is involved. You know, if it's I heard my friend was smoking marijuana or you know smoking marijuana this weekend. That's one thing. If or no, I heard my friend had a drink this weekend. That's one thing. If you heard your friend passed out this weekend from drinking so much, that's another thing. And then it's really it, it although you do not want to impede on the trust that you have with your child, you have to also tell them if it gets to a certain point. Like I'm gonna coach you on how to approach your friend in this way, then you can also say, you have to understand why it's this serious for this reason, this reason, this reason, and I'm gonna to have to say something. And I and I don't want you to feel like I'm going behind your back by saying this. I'm gonna to go to this person and I'm gonna tell these things and these are my concerns with this behavior. Um, because I think what I see in the hospital setting too often is a child does come in because something went too far and people actually didn't know about it. And the child did even say, well, my friend who I've been doing this, you know, I did tell this person I've been doing this, but either people didn't feel like, people just didn't really act, um, or they didn't feel validated or heard when they did say something, so then they stopped talking, and then their behavior escalated. So I think that's the biggest thing, is validate your child when they do say something, and then really make that conscious decision, is this something I can coach my child into going to their friend about, or is this something that I need to escalate myself, and then how can I make sure that I keep a strong relationship with my child in this process of me escalating their friend's issue. And I think you hit on what so many of our students are, are, are dealing with on a regular basis, which is the things they see. And it's not even if they're not at the party, it's the snaps they saw on a snap story that are now gone and they're trying to piece together what happened and, and how to handle these things. and. Um, and, and I think that hits them in, in a lot of a lot of ways. And so at the at the upper school, one of the things we make very clear to students, whether or not they fully believe it, is that if they go speak to Courtney, Courtney has confidentiality. She can't come talk to me about it unless we think a student's going to harm themselves. Right? That is the only access. Now she has her own reporting rights with parents and things of that nature. But we tell them that repeatedly. Um, and, and, and I respect that and I understand that. And so one of the things when Courtney came on board, we made sure that was clear, but we want students to go see here just for that reason. And I would say, and Courtney, a lot of the students come to see you are people worried about their friend. It's less about themselves. And so some, but I also think some really good things we've done for students this year started because a friend came to see Courtney and they started that dialogue. Okay, question is, I have uh, my older daughters are both in high school. One's here, one's in a different high school. And there's a lot of pressure, especially getting towards college applications. I'm getting everything in, getting everything done. So kind of speaking to that high achieving, although my one here, she's a high achiever, um, mostly academically, getting in all the stuff. She's coming home, she's at rehearsal practice, and then she has all this homework she wants to do. And I worry about the sleep. She's not getting enough sleep. Although the school's great that it starts a lot later than the public high schools do. Um, any suggestions on how I can, she's very organized and very balanced, but she just simply doesn't have the time sometimes. How can I help her navigate that? From the Shorecrest perspective, and just I think a lot of the local schools, I would say that's probably the, one of the biggest issues I see in my office is these students dealing with such <coughs> intense anxiety and 
the performance, the expectations, the college, you know, freshman year, they're already panicking, like, I don't know what I want to do with my life, and telling them you shouldn't, you're 14. Um, so I think that's really common, and this came up, I think, even last week, um, when the speaker come in, and it's almost like they feed off each other's anxiety, and they all commiserate in their anxiety, because there's just so many demands put on them. Um, so I think one thing I know that I try to do is kind of focus on like the foundation first and then those other things. So if your sleep is out of order, your eating is out of order, your um, mental health is out of order, all of those things are gonna struggle and it's kind of a trickle or a ripple effect. And so you can be way over here doing a million things, but these things aren't happening and it's just a slow fade until you kind of hit that breaking point. So I try to really encourage them not necessarily to put all of those things on hold, but it's kind of like, we need to go back to square one, we need to go back to that priority. How do we find ways to prioritize your sleep, your mental health, um, whatever that might look like. And maybe that means some of these things get put on the wayside. Maybe that means, forgive me, you get a B in biology instead of an A, you know, like in the big picture of life, your wellness is what matters. That's the thing that is gonna get you through. So, um, I think there comes a point where it's kind of reassessing and stopping everything and looking at if there's something that needs to give because they just can't handle all of that. Um, and probably they will be resistant to that. Um, and then I think if there can, I mean, I know in our AP State class we did like a sleep study and none of them were getting enough sleep. So I think there's almost a proactive plan of how do we shift um, your nighttime routine, how do we shift your phone usage at night. So. I think it almost needs to be kind of a sit down, let's formulate a plan, because if we're just trying to break a habit and kind of hope that we'll have more time, and we all know it's not gonna come. So I think it's a good time for a sit down to really kind of have like a state of the union address of like, where are you at? What do we need to change? And what do we need to add? Everything. I'd really echo all those things, really helping um, our, our kids see uh, the big picture. And also just to reinforce the message again, um, um, just that regardless of your academic achievement, we love you. Is there a trend among kids who are more involved in sports or other extracurricular activities? Do they tend to use more drugs because they're more stressed out? Or they're more healthier because they don't have much time to do <laughs> other things? <laughs> This is a loaded question, um, and it's, it's chicken or egg. I mean, I work exclusively with athletes who are physical specimens. Um, probably have you know some of the highest VO2 max and lactic threshold rates. I mean, cardiovascularly, yet um, are really struggling with mental health issues. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this, but um, so my population, IMG Academy, 1,100 student athletes. We board from uh, what um, sixth grade to post grad, so about 12 to 19 year olds. Um, the 28% of the population that I work with, just in individual psychotherapy, 50% of them have subclinical issues. These are called adjustment disorders, so they are struggling with situational factors and experiencing depressed mood or anxious mood and it's affecting their functioning, i.e. school, sport, or interpersonally. 20% after that have serious clinical mental health issues around major depressive disorder and anxiety disorders, those two chunks. And on that anxiety first, then clinical depression. And how that then also trickles into substance abuse disorders, eating disorders, um, personality disorders. So really kind of how they're coping with really substance abuse from what I see is how they're, well, maladaptively coping with stressors. And so regardless of uh, um, uh, the physical, um, uh, I don't know, <laughs> proficiency, um, that they're not, it's not always internally reflected. So my question is sleep, and I think that that's so important right now. I have a 12-year-old, and 
I sit with her at night and do guided you know, sleep meditations, but is there a particular resource that any of you have found that's been very successful in explaining how important sleep is at this age? And I think that that is really preventative for so many things in life. You know, I try to do it myself, and I think it's a down challenge for all of us, but what particular resources have you found that have been successful with adolescent sleep? Sleep is not sexy. It's really hard to get teenagers to buy into it as much as like, I mean, I could talk about sleep hygiene and create kind of behavioral, um, you know, programs for that. It's just not sexy and it doesn't seem like their peers are into it. Um, so it's really hard to get that buy-in. Um, so I don't know if you guys know of anything. <laughs> There's a good documentary called Sleep in America, that's pretty powerful. Um, also, I would not subscribe to this as a means of changing behavior, but I know when we talked about this in our class, the fact that um, your metabolism is lower when you don't sleep and you're not, you know, basically hitting some of those things that you might want to be doing, that for them almost seemed like the biggest thing that they were shocked by that, as they said, let me think of how they said it, Basically, if you don't sleep, you're going to get fat. I remember that was one of my students' slogans during that uh, unit. Don't encourage that. It's not smart, but I think the more they know all the statistic, you know, influences of lack of sleep, it's helpful. But that's a good documentary if it might provide a visual. It sounds like you're already on the right track um, with working on guided imagery and meditation and relaxation. Um, so again, my role is more in the hospital setting, but one of the issues that we have is a lot of sleep cycles get switched because kids don't, they're not waking up to go to school, you know, they're not waking up to go to a rehearsal or, I mean, they don't have like a reserve band practice and then they're not using that energy. So they're just kind of like laying in bed and then they're up all night and sleeping all day. Um, but what I think is, like could be very valuable is one like like what you said, but also finding a healthier routine for stress relief and relaxation that maybe doesn't involve like video games or phone because right now it's a huge outlet, right? You're working on a math problem and you get stressed out so you just distract yourself really quick, scroll through Instagram and then you go back to the problem and things like that. What I found is a lot of our teens, they're staying up all night doing things that are stress relievers for them, like video games. So maybe finding something that not really is screen-based, but can more be like finding like a, a good book or something else along those lines. Um, I would have already mentioned the things you're doing, which is phenomenal. But those are things we do in the hospital setting, meditation, relaxation, those kind of videos. But trying to change your bedtime habit, I think would be good and a stress relief habit in the evening time um, that doesn't also get them excited like a video game would, for example, stimulated. Do you find teens um, claiming um, anxiety and depression to manipulate their parents for more freedom? <laughs> like, well, <laughs> if you don't want me to have my yeah. back, you know, I'm sad and depressed and this type, this is a thing, right? <laughs> so then how do you start to filter out and approach that and start the behavior modification, but let them have their freedom, but yet say, okay, like you really are depressed and let's, you're not just trying to manipulate for other things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Parenthood is just this like 10 year tug of war, right? I mean, you're on the one end of the rope, your kid's on the other end of the rope. Your job is to provide support, limits, safety, structure. Their job is for autonomy. Freedom. So, <laughs> I don't know, maybe if you let that metaphor um, <laughs> help that dialogue and back to validating what's going on. We want to we validate emotions and, and, and thoughts and cognitions on the one hand um, and set limits and create safeties on the other. Um, sometimes it's more of a pool on your end, sometimes it's more of a pool on their end. Um, oftentimes if there's some manipulation going on, whether it's because of medical illness or mental illness, there's something going on in the relationship. Um, so 
it would make me just wonder about what's happening there. I, in my experience, more often than not, it's usually not the manipulation that's happening. If they're truly depressed or have a mood issue, um, at least the way I sort of train the residents, we're asking pretty detailed history questions. And usually with depression, when you're categorizing sort of mild, moderate, severe, um, you're using screening tools, but you're also getting information like, are you having difficulty sleeping, concentrating, or having thoughts of harming yourself? All of those warning signs that I have up there, decline in school grades, agitation, relationship issues, and look like the proof is in the pudding, right? So it's like, if all of those things are perfect, and they're just saying, well, I'm depressed, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't add up. So usually you have more than just um, you know, your team just trying to manipulate you. If, you're, if your gut is telling you they're just manipulating you because everything else seems really great and we're supportive, then you're probably right, but I would just say that's more rare. It's, if there really is a mood issue, I would encourage you to take it seriously and at least get the evaluation done. Um, if they're truly trying to manipulate you and you're dragging them to all these doctor appointments, they'll probably stop because they don't want to keep going to doctor appointments. <laughs> so um, I would just say, you know, take their feelings and emotions seriously before jumping to um, that this is probably manipulation. And I'll add, and I know the, the faculty would want me to talk about this. So on Friday, when the students were here, we actually brought in another local uh, child therapist who works with a lot of our community and uh, is an alum. And he spoke to us about, because as teachers, more and more, we interface with students who, in the middle of a math test, shut down. Right? I, I've been doing this 22 years. I didn't see that 20 years ago. Right? Or a student who comes in and just says, I just broke down last night, I couldn't write, right? And the teachers are in the same boat you are as parents, which is, when am I helping the student by saying, all right, here's an extra couple days to do it, and when am I not actually helping them? And that was part of the research we went through, the work we went through, which was essentially saying to them, you know, and, and, and I do this in the class I teach, which is a student comes up to me and says, you know, I was sick or I had this problem, can I get a couple extra days? And sometimes I have to make that case and go, yeah, that makes sense. And sometimes I have to say, look, you really need to do this today because you're just avoiding it and it's not going to get any better. And this is a better thing for you and here's why. And a lot of times teenagers don't like to hear that. But if you slowly walk them through, like, this is why this is better for you at this point, and this is why I feel that way, and I love you to death, and you're going to be mad as all get out, but that's where we're at. Our teachers have the same conversations all the time, and, and a lot of times the, the teachers are trying to do that while 12, 13 kids are walking past them in between the classes starting, and a kid just wants to walk up in front of a bunch of other people and say, um, you know, they, uh, my mom had uh, like a, a mental snap last night, I can't take the test. Or I was up till 2 a.m. crying last night, can I get a day? And a lot of times they're in that moment where they want to act real quickly. And so we're trying to coach our teachers on how to calm the moment, delay it for a second, have a real conversation, find out the root of what happened, um, how to be empathetic. One of the things that uh, uh, Dr. Booker was telling us Friday was, um, the last thing you want to do is assure that everything's going to be okay. Don't be, don't be like, it's fine, it's going to be okay, it's going to get. It doesn't help with doing some high anxiety. As you have to validate what they're experiencing and their feelings and say, this sounds really tough for you, this sounds like a hard experience, how do you coping with this, what's, what's your mechanisms, um, and those kinds of things. And so, and so I, I, hearing that, I know my faculty would want me to say, oh, we're trying to do that every single day, right? And at a highly competitive place where people are amazing at a variety of different things, where it's pain, or math, or athletics, and all those kinds of things, they're surrounded by people that are highly achieving all the time. Uh, um, and I think that's, that's hard on them in, in a lot of ways. And then you add in the social media component to that, they can't even go home and get away from it, right? They're constantly also being updated. You know, I'm very mindful as a head of school, the two and a half month period of college announcements, right? I walk on eggs, I do not ask kids that they can share with me. It, it is a very tough time, and it's a tough time in the parent community and the student community as well. And, and how to address those things is, is, is really, really difficult um, along those lines. So. Um, we've reached a, a point in the evening where I want to respect our, our panel's time. I want to respect Mr. Miller's time. I want to thank Mr. Miller for coming in and helping us run this uh, this evening. Uh, um, I did that.
I, I hope, and, and I, I know I'm speaking for the panel a little bit, but this is just the beginning of a conversation, right? The more we keep talking about these things, the more we partner together on a variety of these things, it's, it's just so much more impactful. If you think of a question or something you weren't, you didn't get to ask or something comes up, or maybe you're talking to a parent later and you're like, oh, I went to this thing, now we the saw the staff, and they throw a question that was so fascinating. Email me, email Miss Ellis, uh, email Lisa, we can get answers from, from people. We have uh, relationships with people on this panel, we have relationships with Dr. Reese, I know they want to help us. Um, they do this out of the passion of, of what they do, obviously, and which is helping young adolescents. And so uh, um, let's keep this, this conversation going. So I really appreciate everyone coming out tonight um, and share some of the things you learned. And if you have other things, come ask us, okay? All right, thank you, everybody.